The first war of Scottish independence took place between 1296 and 1328. There were several military campaigns during the war. One of them is the Battle of Falkirk, and here's what happened. After his success at the Battle of Stirling Bridge in September 1297, William Wallace likely spent the next month and a half consolidating his forces and rallying support from other Scottish nobles and leaders who were opposed to English domination. This effort involved gathering troops, securing alliances, and organizing a more coordinated resistance effort. The victory at Stirling Bridge energized the Scottish populace and encouraged more individuals to join the fight for independence, swelling the ranks of the resistance movement. Meanwhile, in France, King Edward I learned of the English defeat at Stirling Bridge, which initiated the movement of portions of the English government to York, and not returning them to London until 1304. The city also served as a central base for Edward's army, and for a time, became the effective capital of England. Between November and December 1297, Wallace and his forces engaged in raids against English-held territories and strongholds in Scotland. These raids served to disrupt English supply lines, weaken their control over Scottish territories, and bolster the morale of the Scots. Wallace led a daring military campaign into northern England, raiding towns from Newcastle to Carlisle, and raided as far south as Northumberland, inflicting damage on English territories and demonstrating the strength of the Scottish resistance. Upon his return to Scotland in December 1297, a meeting was held at the Forest Kirk in the Sheriffdom of Selkirk. It was supposedly there that William Wallace was appointed a guardian of Scotland, although there are some historians that believe he may have been self-appointed. Being a guardian was not simply a title given. The guardians were a group of regents who governed the Kingdom of Scotland from 1286 to 1292, and again from 1296 to 1306, in the absence of a Scottish monarch. The missing monarch here was John Balliol, a puppet king by most accounts, put in place by Edward I of England. Edward deposed Balliol in 1296, declaring himself ruler of Scotland. In April 1298, the Scottish nobles were summoned to meet with the king, and that request went unanswered. Not a single one showed up. Edward I was outraged by this action, or inaction as it were, and declared the Scottish nobles traitors. In the following months, an army was assembled at York, with some accounts stating it consisted of at least 2,500 mounted knights, archers, and roughly 13,000 infantry. Some other estimates claim the size of the army was closer to 18,000 men. This was one of the largest armies to invade Scotland since the Romans in the first century. By early July 1298, Edward and his army had crossed the River Tweed and continued heading north into Scotland, searching for the Scottish army. Wallace and his army were already north of Edward and continued wasting the land behind them, rendering the English king unable to leverage anything to sustain or resupply his army. On July 21st, Edward's army was half-starved, lacking provisions, and on the verge of disbanding when he received word that Wallace and his army were in the vicinity of Falkirk. Edward's response to this threat was that he would not trouble them to seek me. Now, some historians believe that Wallace was hoping the English would be forced to leave Scotland so he would not have to engage them. It's quite possible Wallace was in a position where he was made to fight. The following day, Edward arrived at Falkirk with his army. While not anywhere near as unified or organized as the English army under King Edward I, several Scottish nobles also led contingents of troops at Falkirk. However, internal divisions and rivalries among the Scottish nobility weakened their effectiveness in coordinating their efforts against the English, which heavily outnumbered Wallace's army. Much like the Battle of Stirling Bridge, the Scottish army was heavily comprised of spearmen. As the English forces approached, Wallace reportedly said to his men, I have brought you to the ring, now dance if you can. Wallace structured his army in four shilterns, which are circles of spearmen. The spearmen would be defended by the archers and the knights on either side of them. The Scots were somewhat protected by a marsh in front of them, presumably hoping the English would charge and plunge into it. Things did not turn out as they had hoped. The English attempted to cross the marsh with no success. Led by Earl Marshal Roger Bigod, as well as the Earls of Hereford and Lincoln, the English eventually went around the marsh to the west. Anthony Beck, the Bishop of Durham, commanded the second approach and was able to maneuver around the marsh to the east. It didn't take long for the English knights to drive off the Scottish cavalry. In fact, most of the nobles took their forces and simply left without a fight. Several were wealthy, with estates in England, and some had relatives held as hostages by Edward. Between these factors, their loyalty to Wallace was conflicted and debatable, 
but their actions at Falkirk left little room for interpretation. There were, however, two nobles who stood strong with William Wallace. Sir John de Graham was a close associate of Wallace and a key military leader in the Scottish army. He fought alongside Wallace at both the Battle of Stirling Bridge and at the Battle of Falkirk. Sir John Stuart of Bonkill was another prominent Scottish noble who fought at the Battle of Falkirk. He was a supporter of Wallace and played a significant role in the Scottish resistance against English rule. With most of the cavalry having retreated or otherwise wiped out by the English, the Scottish archers were the next to fall. The English cavalry moved in for an initial approach on the spearmen but pulled back. Essentially trapped and cut off from reinforcements and protection, the formations of the spearmen began to quickly fall apart. The English archers took position and the longbow rained down on the spearmen. Afterwards, a final charge from the English cavalry and the spearmen were decimated. Despite the Scottish having a strong defensive position, Edward I's army, utilizing experience, longbowmen, and cavalry, ultimately prevailed, dealing a significant blow to the Scottish resistance. The battle concluded shortly after it began. The English lost an estimated 2,000 men from their force of approximately 15,000. The Scots lost about a third of their army, losing 2,000 men from their significantly smaller army of a reported 6,000 men. Sir John de Graham and Sir John Stuart were both killed at the Battle of Falkirk. Of the overall commanders who fought for Scotland at Falkirk, Wallace is one of the very few to have survived the battle. Wallace traveled north with other survivors, laying waste to Stirling and Perth. After raiding Perth, St. Andrews, and Ayrshire, Edward restored Stirling but could not maintain an army there. He returned to Carlisle in England in September of 1298. Three months later, with his military reputation destroyed, Wallace stepped down as a guardian of Scotland in December of 1298. The guardianship was then taken on by Robert the Bruce, later King Robert I. As for William Wallace, some stories suggest he went to France for a brief time before returning to Scotland, but there's not much about his activities after the autumn of 1299. The rebellion persisted until around 1304, when most of the Scottish nobles gave in to Edward I. Wallace was arrested and subsequently executed in August of 1305. The following year, Robert the Bruce led the Scottish rebellion and eventually won Scotland's independence.